want needed. Um, so, but the plan for today is very simple. I'll introduce myself. I'll talk a little bit about the course and I will cover a few things that are both important for you as PhD students, as academics, but also it may give you a little bit more sort of guidance or, or perhaps clarity on uh, the, the homework assignments for this project or the pro I mean for this course or the project that you will do for this course. So some of those things that we will be discussing, like for example, what is theory and what theory is not, I guess uh, just about every professor will touch upon that in their courses. But again, since the course is IB theory, and since you will have to write a theory or a theoretical proposal for a study, uh, it's sort of important that we are on the same page with that respect. Uh, so I'll introduce myself first, and then we'll talk about the course. And I even prepared a couple of slides here so you can take a look at them. Um, so let me see if I can share the screen. And um, uh, so, um, so a little bit about myself. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from here. Uh, so um, I'm originally, in fact, I even have a map here, originally from Ukraine. Uh, so was born somewhere around here. At the age of 16, uh, I went to study in Germany. And then since then, pretty much it's been hopping from one country to another, following different schools and universities. So it's been some time in Norway, some time in Texas, uh, uh, some time in Canada, and then actually quite some time now in North Carolina. So it's been something like 11 years now in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is probably the longest address or longest time in one address in my life. And then in terms of my specialization in education, so up until my PhD, I was primarily economics um, and number-based, so to speak, I was teaching statistics uh, at University of Texas at Dallas as a graduate assistant and then as an instructor. But then for my PhD, I switched more into sort of international business with the focus more on uh, people in organizations. So I figured that the software, perhaps if we want to compare people to the software or, or culture uh, is not only more interesting, but in some respects also more important. So you can have the best uh, sort of components of the organization, cash, innovation, I don't know, um, um, patents, uh, equipment, but if people don't work well, uh, then the whole organization crumbles. And so somehow I switched more into this sort of, you know, micro level. Although some of my papers are very much a comparison of either, you know, at the company level or at the country level. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of my experiences, as I said, I've. Uh, lived, worked, studied in many countries, and to some extent, that probably explains my interest in international business. Uh, so, and then I'll be talking a lot about this project that I lead um, that is called Exculture. Uh, so it's been around for about 10 years, 11 almost now. I started it when I came to Greensboro and uh, I work on a regular basis. And by that, I mean, interact pretty much every day with people from, in a given day, about 30 countries, maybe 25, uh, but the total kind of cohort, last semester we had people from 76 countries. And so that's both professors, students, co-authors. So uh, for the last decade plus, um, I've been extremely heavily involved in international everything. So not only as a member of my own co-author teams, but also as an administrator of this big consulting company project but also as, a, um, as an administrator, I not only need to figure out how to manage this whole project, but also we did a lot of research trying to understand what happens when people from different countries come together, trying to develop um, sort of systems and, and, and routines for minimizing problems, maximizing the potential. So um, sort of that's what I do. In fact, uh, it's kind of interesting. Somebody sent me um, a working paper yesterday. They're doing a study on uh, global virtual teams and they do so-called bibliometric studies. So some new technology that kind of maps how all different papers fit together. So it looks like a big network of things. And so one of the slides they had was uh, names of the people who sort of have the greatest impact on research and global virtual teams. Like the bubble size you know, shows the person's impact and the arrows show how these people are connected. And to my big surprise, my bubble was the biggest at least based on their analysis. So I didn't even know that. But yes, global virtual teams, that's basically my, you know, has become my area of specialization, not because that's what I wanted to study, but because managing about a thousand teams every semester put me in a situation where I need to study them sort of for administrative purposes. And then when some of that stuff gets published, even better. Uh, so, and then also just in case, um, that picture of my family, this one is from pre-COVID, so it's like three years ago. So the kids are much bigger now, even though it's only a few years, but they grow fast. 
but yeah, so my wife and the kids here. So uh, my wife is also a statistician. Uh, so kind of very much into numbers and sometimes makes fun of me when I don't know some math. So, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit briefly about myself. And then uh, since we did the introductions, I'll give you some statistics about you guys. So you did complete the survey um, that I asked you to do a couple of weeks ago, if you, if you did just before the class. And literally, if you like within the past hour, I looked at those data. And so some of the interesting findings for me to inform me about the best uh, design for this course. And I will have, by the way, uh, a lot of questions for you. So I think I know the best way to deliver this course. I did teach it last year. It seemed to have gone well. Uh, I got good evaluations. There were one or two students who were a little upset in the end. I made the mistake of uh, not giving grades for intermediate assignments, but put all the weight on the final one. And so uh, for some of them, um, everybody seemed to have thought that they would be getting A plus. And there were a couple of students who got A minuses and apparently they were a little unhappy about that, but still provided very good comments about the course overall. But um, there are still a few things that I'm not sure about. And I will be asking you genuinely, uh, hopefully together we will be able to figure out uh, sort of um, the best design with, that, with the respect to those issues. But first, a little bit of information that I wanted to know about you and specifically, where you stand uh, with respect to your dissertation. In fact, let me explain you why I'm interested in that question. Um, so when I was designing this course, um, I had this brilliant idea uh, that this course will be like one of the courses I took when I was in the graduate school. And namely that course was designed in a way that every word we wrote for the course, it had become essentially part of my dissertation. And so uh, every assignment I did basically we were writing sort of a paper for the course. It became essentially my introduction methods and research section for, for my dissertation. And so last year when I was teaching this course, I thought that would be the same thing. I literally was going to give you the assignment to write the first few chapters of your dissertation and it will be the assignment, you know, you will design more or less your study and then I will help you each step of the way. And this way it will not be effort wasted. You will use it as a template for at least some of the chapters of, of your dissertation. And then to my, not really surprise, uh, I guess, you know, that's expected. I didn't know my dissertation topic for a while, but still, you know, my, my survey showed that most of the students in the first cohort uh, at the time when they took this course, they didn't have a clear plan uh, for, for the dissertation. And so I'm looking at you, you're a little bit more advanced in that respect. So like, for example, 29% uh, of you, uh, so which would be what, like about three students, right? Uh, they said, yes, I know exactly what I want to study. So if you are one of those students, great. So take that topic, write it, at, essentially start writing your dissertation. I'll help you. And then, as I said, whatever you do, it will be not wasted. It will not be just a paper that you do for a class. It will become a future publication, part of your dissertation. So uh, I'm definitely all for it. But then I see there are many students who either still have absolutely no idea or have some idea, but haven't quite figured that out. And so it's not a problem. And it's kind of similar to what we saw in the first cohort. So uh, new guys, um, what I decided to do sort of, if we cannot start working on your dissertations quite yet, because it's still too early for some, for some of you, we'll do the second best thing. Best thing. We will do your uh, comprehensive exams. So as we speak, the first cohort is writing the comprehensive exams. And uh, we went through the exercise of creating the comprehensive exam questions. Uh, so the way they're designed, by the way, so each student gets three questions and needs to design three studies. So you don't need to do the math. Uh, we don't assume that you have the data, but you need to write essentially a study proposal. So you need to justify the important, uh, importance of the study, your introduction section, uh, identify uh, gaps in the literature and say how you're gonna fill them. Then you write some literature review and some uh, theory, and then you describe your methodology in general terms. You don't have the data, but you will say a little bit about what kind of data you will use and what kind of analysis you use. And so for this course, I will be using precisely the same format. Your, your task is to write a, a study proposal and even the wording is basically the same as you will see on the comprehensive exam. So this way, uh, at the very least, it will become a good preparation for your comps. And then for those of you who will choose the topic that you want to keep working on, it will become your future paper or, or dissertation or whichever way you want to use it. So um, as I said, yes, I, if all of you were specifically in this last category, know exactly what you want to do, 
we would work on your dissertation, but no problem. So it's still too early, you still have time. And even those of you who think you know exactly, I bet it will still be changing even for you, but it's good to have at least some general topic in mind. Then um, I was also asking you about uh, the level of your study. So the good thing about international business is that it's very uh, multidisciplinary, multifaceted, so, so to speak. So uh, international business for a long time was not even a self-standing discipline. So people would do HR in international context, strategy in international context. Uh, so many of those things would be more or less, you know, a discipline or finance in international context. And so uh, it's no problem, whatever you want to do. So if you want to focus only on ID, this course will kind of cover the topics that are unique to ID. Like for example, if we talk about expatriation, it's kind of HR, but it only exists in the ID context. Or if we talk about international trade, again, it cannot really be not international. Like if two countries trade, it, it becomes international. But again, if you wanna study people, or if you wanna study teams, or if you wanna study organizations, or if you wanna study countries, all of that fits well with this course. So if you wanna be like, for example, a strategy expert, but you have to take the course in OB, HR, that may feel like a waste of time because you, you don't plan to do research at the micro level or the other way around. If you're more interested in HR or BIO psychology and you have to take a strategy class, again, for you, it may feel like a waste of time. Here, you have the freedom to choose any topic that you wanna to write a proposal for and you can choose it from the level where you are. And I see we have pretty good mix and surprisingly, most of you are actually interested in org behavior, IO psychology. So, which is, I guess it's not good or bad, it's just, you know, good, I guess, in some way, because uh, that's a little bit more where I feel comfortable, but my minor was um, uh, strategy and my pre-PhD studies were all about basically international trade and countries and economics. So I'm comfortable with all levels of analysis, uh, but most of my research or publications at least have been more, more on people. And so from that perspective, I guess it may be a somewhat better fit. But again, those are few of you who are like, for example, strategy or international relations, no problem. I'm, I'm still going to be able to help you with those topics as well. Now, in terms of the preference uh, for workload, uh, not surprisingly, most of you have uh, limited time and uh, likely we don't have anyone who is fully overwhelmed. We had a few students last, last year, uh, but most of you are uh, quite busy and it looks like we have one or two people who are ready to invest multiple hours a day. Great, so um, again, what this tells me and what I will do, um, I will still try to, how should I put it, minimize your um, required involvement for this course. Like for example, I know, and I don't know, I mean, I love those assignments, but based on my discussions with the first cohort and based on your answers here, I think I will stick, and that's one of the questions, by the way, for you. Like for example, some professors ask you to prepare a lecture. So you do the readings and then you deliver one or a part of the lecture. Uh, I decided not to do that. Uh, first of all, most of you have academic experience. So it's not like you need to learn how to teach. Second, I figured it will take a, an enormous amount of time from you to, to prepare. And since the course is not about teaching, but about ID theory, I thought that preparation will not necessarily serve you well. It will cost you a lot of time and the sort of return on investment in that time may not be optimal. I think it will be better if you simply sort of read at your own pace what you need to read and then uh, attend the lecture where I will tell you what I know. Likewise, um, I know the stuff that I teach here. Like this is, this is what I've been studying for like almost 20 years now. And I figured since we have only six weeks, only six live sessions, um, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you will do a great job, but what if some don't? And so uh, I know that I know what needs to be said on each topic. And what if some of you will not prepare a very good you know, component of the lecture or the whole lecture, and then the whole class will sort of be a little disappointed. So I figured this will save you time, will ensure that whatever said in the lecture is exactly what you need to know. And hopefully it will sort of you know, um, relieve you of some of the stresses. And, and you know. likewise, I don't mind if you work in teams, but I know there are some process losses related to teamwork. I mean, I study teams. And again, so it's not the course where you need to learn how to work in a team. So there will be a few assignments where I encourage you to collaborate, but it's not required. But if you wanna to work together, I, I, I welcome that and it will not affect your grade. I don't see that as cheating. I see that as collaboration. 
But again, I decided not to make that mandatory. So this way, uh, the course will be delivered sort of in a more traditional format. You come, I entertain you, or I teach you, I guess, if you want to use that word. Uh, you do the readings as you wish. Uh, but but the, the requirements sort of beyond simply studying that the, the theories will be minimal. Um, so, and yeah, I guess that's kind of briefly what I'll try to do. But there are a few still questions that I have, and I think I'll probably just go over the syllabus. And I'd like it to be more of a conversation. So um, if you have any questions or comments on any of the issues, or um, when I will ask the questions, I would appreciate if you could share your, your sort of input openly and, and, you know, and, and sincere. So some of the things I kind of got figured out, but there are a few that I'm still not entirely sure. So therefore your preferences uh, can change how the course will be structured. So a few things here, one, my cell phone number is here. As you're working on things, don't hesitate to call me when you need to. Uh, my experience is that uh, in three minutes on the phone, we can figure out just about any questions that you have. But if you send me an email, I'll also respond, but it may be a few hours. And by that time, you kind of lose your you know, flow and uh, you know, it may delay you. So uh, if it's something you know, quick that you need just, just to clarify, call me without any appointment. If it's something bigger, I still almost prefer that you call me without an appointment. And the reason for that is I don't have anything on schedule for the next few weeks. I mean, I do have meetings from time to time, but most of the time I'm just working at the computer. And so if you ask me to schedule an appointment, uh, we will waste like half an hour just trying to schedule it and figuring out the time that works for you, setting up the damn Zoom, like it literally takes time. Whereas if you just pick up the phone and call me, no big deal. So I'll pick up, we'll talk. And I kind of prefer phone. And the reason I'll be honest with you is because with the phone, I can put my headphones and I can talk to you and maybe just walk around my table or, or, or I don't know, sweep the floor. So this way it gives me an excuse to get up and, and move a little bit. Whereas if it's a Zoom meeting, I kind of feel obliged to be in front of the camera. And that's another 20 minutes, you know, just sitting and staring at the screen. So my cell phone is here. Email me, no problem. If it's a bigger meeting, yeah, I guess we can schedule a dedicated time. But if it's something quick, just call me. Any time is good as long as it's within kind of reasonable office hours. Uh, communication, nothing special. I tend to get a lot of emails on a regular day. I get about 150. And uh, so sometimes it just, you know, a little difficult to respond to them all within the same day. And so uh, if, uh, if I don't have the time and if I don't know which ones are you, it may be like a couple of days before I see it. But if you put business 730 in the subject line, I'll know that it's a kind of more important one and I'll try to respond the same day. Um, so course, as I said, it's a, the goal of the course is to give you uh, sort of a survey of the field. So not all of you will be doing international business, but presumably all of you need to know all the main theories in international business. And so what we'll do is we will go level by level from the micro level, from people to organizations to countries and review uh, more or less the theories that have been sort of used in international business. So theories that explain how people behave in cross-cultural situations, how companies behave in international context, how countries interact with one another. And you will see many of these theories, they apply equally in like general HR or BU, like when we talk about leadership issues or communication or perhaps maybe some conflicts, but also at the, the firm level. Again, it's kind of hard to, to be a strategist without being international a little bit. So therefore, uh, again, I, I'd like to hope and believe that this review of about 40 theories uh, will be a good exercise, not only in international business, uh, surveying the field, but it will serve you well in whatever other research you will do. And uh, I'll talk specifically about the assignments that we'll do, but um, you will be left uh, at the end of the course, not only, only with a study proposal that conceivably can become part of your dissertation, but also with a nice catalog of um, sort of one page summaries of every theory that has been ever used in international business. I'll show you what they look like in a minute, but I also have a question for you about one very important sort of administrative slash academic issue. Canvas, you know what that is, course format, I kind of already explained it. Uh, one thing I will note here when it comes to weekly live sessions, they are optional. So you are uh, encouraged and welcome to join them. Uh, but if you can't, it's not that I don't care, but I recognize that sometimes you may not be able to. And when that happens, not a problem. I will share the recordings after each lecture and you can watch it later at your own pace, pause it, speed it up. 
Uh, I guess I, I talked too fast anyway, so it probably won't speed it up, but if you want to slow it down, that's fine. Last semester, pretty much all of the students attended every time. I don't think we've ever had anyone absent, like in the whole six meetings, which was strange. I didn't expect that, but it, it did provide, you know, for a nice, uh, you know, set of discussions and we got to know each other very well and started working with a few people as co-authors. I hope you will also attend at the lectures, but if you don't want to, or if you can't, not a problem. So there is no, um, on the one hand, participation requirement. On the other hand, uh, I encourage you to talk and converse during the session. So we'll try to do it as a discussion. But again, there is no um, sort of bonuses or points for talking. And again, the reason for that is one, I don't want you to feel pressured to say something. And second, if it becomes part of the great people just feel obliged to say something, then they sometimes say something that is not even relevant. So they just, they can get the, the checkpoint. So don't feel obliged to say something, but obviously if you have questions or if you have something to add, especially if there is something maybe based on your prior work experience or maybe uh, research, then yes, please do. It makes the lecture better and uh, everybody can learn from you. Uh, readings. So there is a bunch of readings that you will, uh, I wanted to say have to do, but again, it's a lot of readings and I don't think you need to do all of them, but I strongly encourage you to at least take a quick look at all of them. And so I actually prepared the readings for you. So I know some professors believe that um, uh, asking you to go and find those PDF files uh, at Google Scholar or library is a good exercise. I don't think it's good. It's, it's boring. It's time consuming. It's like most of us hate it. So I figured it will save you time if I find those papers. And uh, at the same time, um, um, I know this way you have the, the papers because some of them are hard to get. And so um, this way you have them. The only thing is, so if you go to all readings uh, right here, so this is the collection of all the readings that I recommend, and I updated, uh, I added some new ones based on uh, our discussion last semester, but uh, some of them, the ones with the um, uh, asterisks, these are sort of uh, highly recommended, and I hope you will at least take a quick look at the abstracts or, or maybe read them. In fact, it's not that many, so possible to read all of them, but then there are some more that I recommend for deeper understanding. And again, don't be afraid by the number. So the reason I set it up this way is because I want you to use this document and this collection of PDF files as your um, sort of handbook of sorts. Like, you know, if you ever need to do anything on, for example, let's say, you know, what's the topics here? Uh, culture. Let's say you want to do something on culture, cultural distance, acculturation and secure. This is a state of the art excellent collection of readings. Like if you read them, you know most of the things that are to know about culture, filtration, cultural distance. And so this way, uh, you don't need to look for the literature because if you go to like Google Scholar, for example, right? Let me show you. Let's say you wanna do something about cultural distance, right? So you go uh, cultural distance, my forecast, there will be 25,000 papers. Uh, oh, there are 5 million, of course. Well, let me do it like this. I don't think there are 5 million, but if I do cultural distance like this, 90,000. Okay, I underestimated a little bit, but there are 90,000 papers. I haven't read all of them, but I've read most, well, most of the wrong word, but definitely hundreds and hundreds on the topic. And based both on my own understanding of the topic, but also I collected, in fact, if you ever need that, I also have a collection of uh, syllabi, um, for IB theory courses. So I reached out to my partners in the X Culture project. We have hundreds of them. And as you can see, 73 of them sent me their syllabi for a course like this. And so some of the names here you can recognize maybe like really big names like Paul Demish, Demish uh, Mark Peterson. I mean, these are people like Len Trevino. These are people, Masaki Kotaba. He was the former president of the AAB. Uh, so we are talking about some you know, big names here. And so I looked at what they assigned to their students. I have my own collection and I figured I'll just give you sort of a nice reference guide. So you don't need to read all of them now, but if you ever need to come back to any of these topics, you'll have a nice sort of survey of the field collection of readings. If you read these papers, you'll know 85% of what needs to be known on the topic. So you will still not know everything, but at least you'll have you know, most of the things covered. And so this way you don't need to waste your time on trying to find the relevant studies. You got the collection here. And so for the required studies, the ones with the asterisks, I already got them for you here. So you don't need to look for them, they are available. And then for the, for the optional ones, I didn't go that far, but so uh, those, if you need to, you can find them. 
I'll ask you this though. So if you do find studies that are on the list, but not the sort of the required part, send me the copies. So as long as you send them to me and especially if you uh, label them as name, year and the first few words of the title, then yeah, it will be easy for me to add them to the collection. You have that link uh, forever and ever. So I gave you the direct link to my Dropbox. So as long as I teach this course or as long as it sits on my hard drive, you'll have a direct access. So if you add something, not only you as a cohort can use it, but hopefully the first cohort students will still have access to it. And then the future generations. So I'm not planning to rename the folder so that the same links work together. So maybe with your help, we'll even have the full collection, which is probably like about two, 300 papers here on the list. So to summarize, not required, uh, highly useful if you ever need it, highly recommended to read at least you know, quickly during this course to get a better idea. So it's still a lot of readings, but you know, you, you'll see some of the things. And uh, for some of the topics, you will see that you know, a lot of these papers are by me. Um, it's not because I'm sort of you know, shameful self-promotion. It just on some of these topics, I happen to be the author of them sort of more cited papers. And so it just made sense to include them. Like this one was originally intended to be as a kind of personal catalog and it somehow generated, I don't know how many, but it's like hundreds of citations. So I figured, you know, if it's a good study, even if it's mine, why not include it? So on the micro level, there will be a bunch of studies that I wrote, but again, it's not because I want to promote myself. It's uh, mainly because it just, like, I happen to be you know, an author of some of these works. Um, so let's go. Any questions about readings or about lectures or anything else related so far? When there are no questions, it either means that everything's clear, there is nothing to ask, or you already are overwhelmed and have no idea what I'm talking about and why, like, what is going on. Yeah, we don't. So I hope it's the first one. I hope everything's clear. You don't really need it. So, but yes, you have direct links to the Dropbox uh, for the readings and you can get them at any point in, in time. One thing that I also added um, to, to the collection here is the syllabus from my online version of my uh, Management 301 course, which is an intro course for the IB. And the reason I included that core, that, that syllabus is because in the final section here, if you go to my, uh, if you go to my lectures, for each of the topics, I have a video lecture and you can either stream it on YouTube or download it. And I have some of the, again, readings again linked here. But um, if you find any of these topics particularly interesting, and if you feel like you're not getting enough from this course that is more kind of PhD level, and focuses on you know, articles that presume some level of understanding and uh, sort of you know, rigor, but you wanna get a more kind of introductory level overview, you will get the actual lectures here. So when you click on the link, it just opens the lecture and you can watch it on YouTube. And so I'm not sure if you need them, but uh, if you wanted to, you can look at them. Surprisingly, some of them actually have quite a few views. Like I have some that have like hundreds of thousands of views. I don't know who watches them. I put them in open. So it seems like some of them people just find it interesting. But in any case, they may be useful if you want to major in IB and didn't have much exposure. So, uh, but that's again, not required. So it's something that you can if you need to, uh, can do if you need to, but not required. So we're talking Bye. about that. yes. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. want to make sure I'm following on the readings. And were there some that you particularly considered minimal level readings? Or if I was following, you said encouraged us to try to read the asterisks, maybe at least the abstracts and discussions. But I wasn't sure if you were pointing us to a you know, make sure you read these five to keep up with class, but these 20 are recommended. I, I'm not sure. I this is a very good question, you. Karen. And honestly, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful in answering it. So the honest answer between us is that you don't have to read them, meaning that I will not quiz you on any of them. Um, at the same time, there will be one of the requirements for the course, uh, and that's a one page summary of a theory or a paper. And so at least for that, you will need to read one of the papers and then provide a one page summary. And I'll talk more about that. So it's up to you which one you choose, but you will have to read at least some for that assignment. Um, at the same time, I do very strongly believe, so even though I honestly admitted that I will not quiz you on them. So if you don't read them, I suppose, uh, you know, it will not be reflected in any way on your grade. 
But at the same time, I very, very strongly encourage you to read the papers on the reading list with the asterisks. So it's not a huge uh, collection, as I said. So if we go to all, all readings in the oh, sorry, that's, that's the wrong file. So if we go to this one, so you'll have about uh, five to maybe 10 papers uh, for each of the weekly assignments. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, so it's like for the first one, you have uh, about 10. For the next week, when we talk about, um, actually, there are a little bit more. So there are more because you have 10 and then you have a few more. But some of them, I even put two stars because I feel so strong. Like, I feel that any minute you spend on spending uh, on, on uh, reading this paper, it will save you 20 hours over your career. Like some of these papers are so important uh, that, um, uh, you know, I will not quiz you on it, but you need to talk about, you know, you need to know about this whole issue. Like, for example, with the obsession with theory in organizational behavior or, or in uh, management research in general. And if you read a paper like this or this, for example, uh, you know, you will be remembering and going back to this sort of idea and, and, and discussion that, you know, over and over again. So therefore, if I were you, I would definitely try to read all of the papers with the asterisks at the very least, take a look at them, open them, read the abstract, and take a look at the main points. Uh, many of them are shorter papers, uh, like some of them are big, you know, like full scale papers. Some of them may be relatively short. So, like, for example, this one here is only four pages. So, I would definitely try to look at all of the ones with the asterisks um, because it will be time well spent. It will save you time and effort over your academic career. But if you're too busy, or if some of these topics seem to be completely irrelevant to what you do, let's say the topic deals with uh, you know, leadership or, or, or teams, and you know you want to study only companies, I suppose it's fine if you skip it. But then if, the, if, the, if it's the topic that you really need and know, like for example, let's say you know, your research will deal with uh, cultural distance, for example, then I would even read these additional key papers uh, to fully understand the topic. So therefore, I guess my answer is imprecise in that respect, but yes, it's up to you how much you wanna read. More is better. Don't feel obliged to read all. You'll have to read at least one of them because there will be an assignment each week that you need to summarize it. So I guess at least that one will be required, uh, but otherwise it's up to you and I hope you'll find time to do more. I realize, you know, since we have only one week between each of the lectures, it's a lot of reading. So we have several topics sometimes covered in a given week. And so if you read all of them, you know, cover to cover, it probably will be too much time requirement given that it's a compressed summer semester. Uh, but yeah, I hope you will find some topics so entertaining, entertaining that you'll read everything and maybe even read a few more uh, on your own initiative. So if I can put it that way. All right, oh, by the way. Perfect, that was, that was exactly what I was asking. So thank you. Yeah, my first and last name were uh, reversed. Yeah. All right, so uh, that's about readings. Now, in terms of the assignments, um, so there will be a paper proposal or study proposal, and there will be those one pages, and I'll talk about them separately in a minute. Uh, so, but uh, first, a little bit about um, the paper proposal. So, the ultimate goal here is to write a proposal that looks exactly the same in terms of the format and the length as your comprehensive exams. And for the comprehensive exams, you will have three weeks, three questions. So you'll have basically one full week to answer each one of them. Here, you'll have six weeks for one, but again, you have to do other things. During the comps, you will have only that, and I assume you will be doing nothing else. Here, you have other obligations in life. You'll have the readings, you have the one-pagers. So uh, hopefully it will be more or less the same type of workload you know, uh, intensity given that you have other things. And so I don't want you to wait until the very end to get my feedback. So we will go through several stages here. And I have, I think uh, there, there is a page that describes that in a little bit more detail, but I'll go of this one. So here is what we'll do. Uh, so this week you don't have to do anything. So that's the first week. But by the end of the second week, you will have to come up with three viable ideas for an IB research paper. So you only have to come up with that basically title for the paper or title. And uh, I believe I actually asked you for the research question and possible hypotheses. So you give me like literally half a page, not even half a page. You say, I, uh, I, I in fact, you know what? Um, I actually have here examples. I created fake. In fact, one of the questions I'll have to, for you is whether or not I should show you what students last semester did. But one thing you have access already to is sample uh, assignments. 
And so for these sample assignments, what I did for each of the assignments, I created essentially what a perfect assignment would look like using my own dissertation as an idea, as an example. So for the, uh, the end, by the end of the first week, you will need to come up with three viable research ideas. And so I wrote here what I would have done. So for example, one idea, the effect of cultural distance on performance of expatriates. So do cultural intelligent expatriates perform better? So my research question is, does cultural intent, uh, uh, distance between the home and host countries affect uh, how well expatriates uh, perform? And the, uh, sorry, I was talking about cultural distance, not cultural intelligence, cultural distance. The more th the different are the cultures, the harder it is for expatriates to perform. So the question is, is it true? The hypothesis is the greater the cultural distance, the lower the expatriate performance. That's all I need. Then second idea was based of direction of acculturation of expatriates. And then you have a simple research question. And then same thing for the third one. So that's the assignment. You'll do the same thing and it can be any topic you want. Uh, I mean, as long as it has an international dimension. What we'll do with that one, and it will be only with this first week um, assignment, I'll post all of them uh, on uh, Qualtrics and I'll give you a full list. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like uh, with the first uh, cohort. And I will ask you to look at everybody's ideas and rate them in terms of viability, uh, basically you know, how, how good that study might be, and then also sort of how interesting it is. And so this is, this is what we did the first time. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like. I'll do exactly the same thing for you. And so this way, it's not graded, but this way, one, you will see what the rest of the class does. And two, so like, just like this. So you have idea, research question, hypothesis. Idea, research question, hypothesis, no names. You don't need to necessarily need to know uh, who is who, but I'll share the summary of the results with you. So let's say the first three ideas are yours and you'll know that, for example, you know, the class felt that it's like, wow, or maybe it's boring, or maybe it's just okay, or whatever the average is. And then the, the, the class also will think, you know, if it's publishable or not. And so you will come up with three ideas, but as you are yourself trying to decide which one is the most interesting and the most publishable, you'll also get input from the other 10 people in the class. And so hopefully this way for the next assignment, you'll need to select one of them. Hopefully that will inform you which one has the greatest potential. So, uh, and plus again, as I said, you will see what other people are working on in case you ever want to co-author stuff. So we have some people in the first cohort that work together on papers. So, so this way, at least you will know what interests your, your team members, I mean, uh, classmates. And maybe some of those topics will be like, oh, that's interesting, maybe we'll want to work together. So uh, then next week, you will have to come up with one idea and be a little bit more uh, specific about it. So you'll, you'll maybe come up with a little bit more refined hypothesis, maybe a little bit more refined paper, but it will be like a half a page description of that specific one idea that you will then develop into proposal by the end of the course. Then next week you do the initial description. So maybe like one page, maybe a couple of pages. So you sort of start talking about, uh, you know, more details, how you will do it. Like basically, you know, jot some notes about, uh, data about theory, maybe a little bit, you know, whatever you have at that time. Then finally, you will have uh, initial paper proposal, kind of short outline, uh, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, almost like what, what goes into that paper now in the outline form, then a draft essentially, and then finally the final paper. And so this way uh, we will progress step by step. You will get feedback each week of the way. Uh, you will be graded on each of those. And so last time I was very generous during these initial phases. So as long as it looked like you're on the right track, I gave you a hundred. This time, if I will feel that you may not be fully on the right track, uh, I'll give you partial credit so that you know that, you know, like, for example, a few students provided hypotheses that were um, sort of too descriptive, not, not, you know, prediction, but more like how things work. Well, it's not really a hypothesis, it's a question. And so I said, well, I'm sure you can do it better. I gave a hundred points. But this time, this one will, you know, you will lose points because it's, it's not really a hypothesis. And so this way, I'll send you a signal early that you maybe need to take a closer look and uh, refine some of these things. So we will go kind of progressively in this way uh, from a very simple to, to the final paper. And so this way, you hopefully will be able to sort of use my feedback and suggestions and improve a good proposal by the end. And then also, um, uh, you will have to write short uh, one page summaries of uh, theories of your choice in each of the topics. And here I have a question for you. So I do have, so, and, and I encourage you to collaborate with one another in the way you distribute the topics so that 
Each one of you does a different topic. And so at the end, you will have not only the collection of readings, but you will also have these one pagers with essentially each of the theories in idea described on one page. And so this is what it looks like from the first cohort. Like for example, let's say, uh, you know, diversity fault lines. So uh, it's, it's a theory that says that uh, when people in a team are all similar or everyone's different, then, you know, it's sort of evenly, diversity is evenly distributed. But if you have like, for example, half and half, you know, let's say half Ukrainians, half Americans, that creates a fault line. So that creates this us versus them opportunity or, or mindset. And that leads to all kinds of problems. Or if you have, for example, young and old, or if you have, uh, I don't know, accountants and engineers. So that creates a fault line and it can lead to tensions. And so here you have a nice one page summary of this theory. So this is the paper that introduces the theory. And then you have a nice summary by, by lens. And so here is my dilemma. Even though the students in the first cohort didn't cover all of the topics, they covered most of them because we had, I believe it was like 17 students total. Uh, in fact, let me check, I can tell you exactly. Uh, 23, I don't know, do they have that many students? Or oh, maybe some of them were PDFs and I created Word. But it was, you know, so th that cohort is much bigger. So we had close to 20 or so uh, theories covered or papers covered in one pages. Now, I am very tempted to share this with you. My hope is that you will look at what's been done before and you, you will build on it. You will do it even better. Maybe you will find some of those summaries not complete or maybe some of those, you know, points not entirely accurate. Or maybe there are a few other paper, you know, papers or theories that were not fully covered and maybe you'll choose to work on those. At the same time, if I show you what the previous cohort did, in a way, they did a pretty good job. And so in a way that leaves little work for you to do because you can then, not that you will copy, but you will say, well, I wanted to describe, for example, fault, fault lines theory. But I mean, Lance already did it so well, I can't really add anything to it. So what, what am I supposed to do? And so many of you are teachers, like what would you do? I think for your learning, it would be better if you saw what the previous cohort did, used it, incorporated it, built upon it and did even better. But then I don't know how I would grade it because you know some of those are very good. So, so you tell me what you think about this one because I'm leaning towards sharing that with you, but I don't know how to do it in a way that it doesn't undermine sort of the academic integrity of the course. What's your, what's your take on this one? I feel like, um... I think it's a great gesture and, and ultimately, I think collectively after we do ours and we combine them with the th first cohorts, so we might have, you know, a really good big encyclopedia. I would, I, I wondering from my perspective, I'd like to hear what everyone else thinks, but I might end up spending more time trying to make sure that what I'm writing is different from what the papers are there. Um, as opposed to actually going in and just starting from scratch and just sort of, you know, learning and, and you know, building it from the ground up. But um, we we'll want to hear what everyone else thinks. Wise words. One thing I will say also, again, in full disclosure, pretty much everyone who attempted uh, uh, last semester, they did a good job. And for, for the one pagers, everybody got 100s. I had a few cases when students didn't submit anything. And so for whatever reason, they got busy and they got zeros. And there were, I think, one or two in the whole 20 times six weeks uh, when the work was sub substandard. And I think I gave like a couple of, you know, lower grades, like 70 or 80. So they were not bad, bad, but, you know, it was not 100. But pretty much in 99% of the cases when students attempted, uh, they did an excellent job and I couldn't give them less than 100. And so that's what I expect from you. And my logic is that if you will be getting 100 anyway, why not, or most likely you will be getting, why not let you sort of build upon prior work, use it as a reference, do it better. So yeah, I don't know. A any other opinions here? I kind of I kind of have the same similar thought that Teresa did. I would love to be able to read theirs after I did mine to see if they came up with some different thoughts, but I still, because I don't have as much experience in IB, I would also like to get the ability to sort of formulate some of it myself. And I think, yeah, it would be, and I would rather do that using the, um, the readings than the prior cohort. I don't know. Now, so Erica, does it mean that you don't want to even have access to them? Or if you did ha have access to them, you would still first read the paper, do your own, at least some sort of summary and only then look at it. Meaning that I can release them, you know, like at the end of the, or at the beginning of the next week. So after you submitted your work 
And, and my plan was either do it at the end, basically say, okay, here is your collection, but for your reference, here is the first forward collection or week by week or at the beginning. And so that's what I'm not sure. So should we just wait until Monday past the deadline and then release them? Okay, well, you seem to be that's very awesome. honest, and <laughs> but that's good. Yeah, that makes sense. In fact, I think that would be best. So I'll then release them one by one after the fact, but then you will still have that collection. And then maybe with your permission, I'll also uh, add yours to theirs so that if they ever come back to that link, they will see your work as well. One more yep. question. So, uh, Boz, yes. uh, I was just going to chime in and say I would turn the question around and ask you what is it that you're wanting us to accomplish with the activity if it's just to build on that to build the database or is it truly just for people who are unaware or unfamiliar with these theories that you just want us to explore and read and, and build that it's a little bit of what is the objective would be my question for you to be able to answer your question and to yes. add to that, Karen, I was thinking, are there articles that haven't been summarized that would be helpful for us to take a look at yeah, yeah. Um, out of that group? Yes, there have been a few that haven't been summarized, and maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I'll just identify those and sort of suggest that you make them your priority. The previous group, they had, I think they used Doodle, and they literally listed all, and then they were claiming like, you know, so that there is no overlap, so everybody does something else. Again, I don't mind if two people do the same one, no problem at all. So whatever you think is more relevant for your work. But back to Karen's question. So there are two re or two, two uh, sort of goals for me. One, I want you to sort of deeply understand those theories. And so my logic is that if you summarize it, you know, if you read it, you probably understand much. But if you have to summarize it on one page, you really have to understand it. And so th this provides bo both um, a good exercise for you in truly understanding the theory, but also that's a way for me to test if you actually understand it now. Ideally, I want you to summarize every single paper, every single theory, but I know that in a summer course, it's unrealistic. That's why it's one per, per student. But the second goal again is that at this time, you don't know what you will need five years from now. Maybe you'll be writing some paper on that, you know, culture, I mean, um, diversity of fault lines and stuff like that. And so uh, my hope is that if everybody does a different one, and you need a quick reference guide. So we kind of build that encyclopedia. And so in the future, you can then quickly review, like let's say you're looking for some theory for a study that you need, uh, you know, to, for a paper that you need to write. And you don't know which theory explains your hypothesis. So you can quickly go through those one pages, select the ones that, you know, you need, read it, make sure that it's what you need, and then maybe go to the full text paper once you know that that's exactly what you need. So this way you kind of are left with this catalog that you can use for the rest of your life, or at least for many years to come until more better theories come along. So, all right, a related question too, I, I meant to ask it about the video lectures, same thing. So I not only have, you know, we will have the live lectures, but I do have the recordings of the last semester's lectures and those I did share with you. And so I'm planning to say more or less the same things. The only thing that I will change a little bit is that I had a guest speaker pretty much every lecture last time. And I even had two high profile guest speakers in kind of off time. So they were not available at the time of the lecture. Uh, one of them was in Australia and the other one was in the United States, but was not available at this late hour. So this time I decided not to use guest speakers. And I'm not sure, you know, if it's a good idea, like I got very positive feedback on guest speakers and I can easily invite them again, I suppose. But um, um, I don't know, I mean, being the class being at 8 p.m., sometimes with the guest speaker, we had not much time left for anything else. And so while it was a lot of fun, I felt like sometimes we were sitting until literally 10 p.m. or even later. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking I'll probably be a little bit more focused this time. So one of the guest speakers was talking about writing a dissertation. So Daniel Roddick, he got best dissertation award from both the Academy of International Business and Academy of, uh, of uh, Management. Uh, but then again, we have a recording. So if you're interested in that topic, you can watch it. Uh, I had someone who talked a little bit more about uh, research on people. I had someone who talked a little bit more on research, sort of meta-analytic research. Uh, we had Anwil Hartson who talked about publishing game. And we talked, uh, we had um, uh, Michelle Gelfand who was talking about grants. So she's had grants in millions. But the concern I had, and actually my superiors expressed a little concern about that, that, you know, grants, it's a very important topic for US PhD students. Publishing game is a very important topic, but it's not really IB theory per se. So it's not part of the course. Uh, writing dissertation, not exactly part of the course. And I kind of agree with that. On the one hand, I believe you're not getting enough of that general stuff. 
On the other hand, I guess, yeah, maybe this course is not really the place to get into all that generalist stuff. So therefore you do have the recordings of those guest speaker presentations. There is probably no point in asking them to say the same things again. Uh, I guess it would be nice to, to have it live so you can ask questions, but I assume the questions you have were already asked by your predecessors before. So therefore, I don't know, I, for now, I, I posted those video lectures. If you wanna watch them, you can. We will still have the live meetings uh, in case you wanna interact with the classmates with me. Uh, I will be saying to a large extent the same stuff, maybe a little bit differently, because again, my understanding of these topics evolves. I've published more papers on, on these topics over this year. I had a chance to reflect on the last semester. So I think I will do a better job this time now that I've done it before. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know, I figured if I have the recordings, why not share them with you in case you want to watch them maybe in advance or maybe if, if only for the guest speaker. So, but I don't know, I mean, any, any thoughts? Because at some point I even thought that maybe instead of delivering sort of lectures or reviews, maybe I'll say just watch the recording and we will use these lectures purely for feedback on your papers. Uh, kind of do like a flipped classroom. But I don't know, I mean, I'm, somehow it just feels like it would be, we have only so many, so few opportunities to meet. I felt that if I make you just watch the recordings, it will be sort of cheating on my end. Uh, so I don't know. A any thoughts on that? Like I, I just felt that it would be sort of me not doing my job properly, even though yes, you, you can watch the recording that is almost as good as whatever I will deliver this semester. I don't know, any, any thoughts, any preferences, any requests? I'd prefer to have you lecture to us so we can ask questions. We are a pretty vocal group and I promise we will have plenty of questions. Well, Let's do it that way. So, and maybe sometimes if you have a lot of questions about your papers and would rather prefer me to talk a little bit more about that, maybe we'll cut some topics a little shorter and I'll just say you can watch a full discussion in the recording from the last semester. So, but anyway, so let's, where did let's, you post the guest speakers? Uh, they would be part of the, so let me show you, they would be part of the lecture. So if you go to Canvas, uh, let me just open that, um, and you go to modules, um, you would have a video lecture for each of the weeks. And um, so it would be part of the, so if you go to here, modules, right? So okay. you see, like, for example, uh, so that's the, uh yeah so there's the recording oh, i was thinking yes. the guest speakers were separate but you're saying that no, no, to go into your lectures. various usually it okay. would be like the first Got 30 it. minutes or so of the lecture and then uh and we had a few lectures as i said uh off topic but they were so you know so general that uh, i think i still included them somewhere here but if not that's that's a different topic so, so to speak so probably that was me taking it a little too far. And they were, as I said, even in the additional time. Uh, they are still available on YouTube though. If you go to, uh, I can send you the links. Um, so if you go like, uh, uh, so it would be, I guess, uh, Vas Taras, uh, um, for example, um, and Will Harting. So I'm pretty sure that it will be the first link. Yeah, right here. So yeah, that's the recording. And so we had the whole class, but that was a whole hour that we discussed. So um, so I'll send you these links, uh, this one's here and I'll open the other one again. I felt that there were something that you as, um, as um, uh, you know, future or current academics, you need to know these things. Like Anne Will is an expert on the publishing game. So she wrote books about it. She, she's sort of on the forefront of some of the thinking of how we approach the topic. And so it was just, you know, foolish not to, to use that opportunity. Although I'm not sure if I want to sort of bother her the second time, given that she already, you know, gave us an hour and we have the recording. So anyway, so let's let's take a look at the rest of the syllabus. So you have those one pagers. We talked about that. So that's the course scale. So I expect that most of you will get an A, but uh, most likely at least one or two of you will get less than A, maybe A minus. I don't expect less than that, but you know, if somebody will be a real slacker, get less of that. So don't get upset. Um, as I said last semester, I got very good comments, but I think there were two students who got A minus, not even a B plus, I think it was A minus. And so they were a little upset because they expected an A, my feedback was positive, And I felt that their work was not bad, but it was definitely weaker than those who got an A. So I'll try to be a little bit stricter throughout the semester so that there are no surprises. And so if you happen to be one of those who will get an A minus or B plus, uh, don't get mad. I mean, not everyone needs to get an A or 
you know, uh, deserves an A, of course. Again, I don't think we will be in the D range unless somebody is really sort of lazy, but otherwise it should be fine. And if everybody gets an A, that's, that's perfectly fine too. So that's not a problem. Now, in terms of the papers, so as I said, uh, so first week we just do meet and greet. There is nothing else uh, that you need to do. Then you have three ideas and we discussed that. So just a few lines here, so half a page total. And then we will also do kind of collective evaluation of the viability and publishability of those ideas. Then you'll have a one page sort of description of the paper. So what the title will be, maybe one or two research questions a little bit deeper, maybe one, two or three hypotheses. And then maybe even a couple of lines, a few lines of the paper description. And I describe here what I will be looking for. Then we go to the initial description of the paper up to two pages. So basically same as last week, but in more detail. And so then I describe what I will be looking for. Then initial paper outline. So you have a bullet point for each of the paragraphs essentially in your paper. So you know precisely what you will be saying there. You just don't have it in full text. And then finally you have uh, extended outline and then final paper at the end of the semester. So um, yeah. uh, theory summaries, we talked about that. Um, Participation, we talked about it. So there are no exams, no required teamwork, but you're welcome to collaborate on the one pagers. You're welcome to share your paper and feedback on your papers. I don't see that as a problem. Uh, so, and I already gave you sample samples from, from you know, that I prepared. Uh, I'll think if I, I think there is no problem if I share it with you what students did last semester. If you want to take a look at what they did. Maybe we'll do it at some point in the middle of the semester, or maybe I'll use some of the better examples in our lectures as examples. Uh, different assignments, if you, you know, whatever happens, uh, travel, uh, illness, let me know, uh, no problem. It's a small class, we can definitely make accommodations. So we're not an undergraduate students and I don't see my role as teaching you how to obey deadlines. <laughs> my kid, if I can complain here, my kid, he is uh, at the uh, North Carolina a and Early college, which is a high school at the NC uh, NC and A and T University, and so now he's in his third year, so he's taking the regular college courses, and so for one of the courses, uh, English composition and writing, um, so it's a regular college course where they have to write a paper. So he was ahead of schedule, wrote a great paper. I felt it was a great paper, but the guy forgot about the deadline and submitted it next day after the deadline, and the paper is sixty percent of the total grade. And so he got an F. And so I felt that was way too harsh because you know he got, you know, was active in discussions, got good grades on his drafts. He just missed the deadline. And it wasn't like you know, minus 20% for late submission. Uh, it just coincided with his SAT. And she said, no, zero, you missed the deadline. We need to teach you how to stick, stick, stick with the deadlines. So now he's taking it again. This time we have to pay the tuition because it's a retake. Uh, but hopefully that will, and, and his GPA goes into his application this year, so we cannot afford an F. But I felt, yeah, it's an English class. It's not a project management class, so deadlines. So yeah, if you miss something, don't panic. It's not a course where I, I'm trying to teach you to stick with the deadlines. You have the deadlines, but if you're a little late uh, for a good reason, no big deal. Tell me, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, so um, what else here? So, and then you have basically the table schedule. So you know which topics we cover, you know uh, what the readings are, what the assignment is, and the live le sessions, uh, the same link is for the whole semester. So once you register once, it adds it to your whole semester. Uh, all deadlines for the one pagers and for the paper progressive sort of drafts, uh, Sunday midnight. Uh, and so usually I will download them Monday noon or so. So therefore, if you're past midnight or you know, like early Monday morning, no worries, I will not even see that you're late. Uh, or if you need an extension, that should be fine as well. So that's all I had to say about the course, if you have any questions. And I wanted to devote a few more minutes to today's topic. But first, I, I would like you to sort of uh, talk if you have any questions about the course format. You don't care if the one pager, the one you shared from your, the student last semester was like paragraphs, and then the one that you have, like a sample one, is just bullet points. Do you don't have? A uh, so no, no. What one pagers? Uh, they would be probably more like a whole page because it's a description of a theory. So what I shared with you was the first assignment. In fact, yeah, let me share all of them. So if I go here back to sample assignments, and you have access to exactly this folder, so. For the first one, as I said, it's just the three ideas, right? 
For the second one, that's one idea and it's described in more detail. So here I have three questions. So I basically took one of those topics. I expanded it a little bit more. So it's not only do people change their cultural values over time as they move to new country, but I added also if so, how fast and what speeds, down, speeds up or slows down that process. And then I have a few more hypotheses. There was only one, now there are more. And I even included a little bit of theory. So I think these will be the theories that I will work on. So then for the next one, I have the initial description. So here I have a much more detailed stuff. I have a little bit more in theory. I have a little bit more in method. So it's still one page, but it's, it's a little bit more refined. Then for the next one, it will be like a couple of pages. So as you see here, I have a bullet for each of the paragraphs. So in my final proposal, each of these will become a full paragraph. And the whole proposal will be probably like five pages instead of just one or two pages here. So, but I will look at it and I will tell you, okay, maybe in your method, you wanna say a little bit more about sample, or maybe you wanna go first with the sample then with the measures, or maybe for your literature review. So you wanna review these three, three things, but I'll say, and don't forget, maybe you wanna take a look at that stuff. So I'll sort of uh, direct you so that when you write the paper, you, you don't miss anything. And then, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I was sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I can ask at the end. Yeah. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, if it's about. Oh, it was about the theory paper, those one pagers for the theory paper. Yeah, yeah. so uh, let me finish this one and we'll go to the theory paper. Then finally, you know, like an extended detailed outline and then the final paper. And here for you, I even included my actual dissertation. So yeah, I have the dissert, like the, the full dissertation that I like, one, you know, the idea that I developed here is my dissertation. So I included the whole full thing, whatever number of pages I have, 300 pages. And then even a paper that was published based on the dissertation. Uh, so basically first it was writing a lot of hundreds of pages and then condensing it to only 23 pages for the publication. But for the one pagers, um, uh, yes, uh, let me go back there and just show you what they look like. Again, a couple of, let's say ma ma macro. So uh, just a few examples here. Um, so, um, most of them are basically, you know, bullet lists, but that's fine. So it's easier to read, easier to navigate, but you will see that some of them are plain text. Let me open a couple more. Uh, so I don't know, like for example, here, another one. So also seems like a bullet list. Uh, so main idea, so the postulates and then uh, applications and limitations. You know what, maybe I'll release at least one of those collections so that you can see it, how they were done uh, maybe for the first week, kind of preemptively, so that you can look at them and uh, and see how they were done. And I think I also had a couple of summaries of my own. Did I have the? Let me see if I had the examples of my own. Maybe I didn't. So, uh, but yeah. Mars, are you showing us? I'm sorry. Are you showing us your file structure on your hard drive? Is that what we're looking at here? Yes. Or is this and, something uh, that yes. we actually and have? When you, yes. Access when to? you go to, let me show here. When you go to your course, you have access to these very files. So when you go to, uh, right. in, to in the section files, so right. it comes to uh, sample assignments, for example, right? Uh, so when you will go here, you will see it looks uh, exactly the same. Yeah, sample one summaries, pages, pagers. Uh, let me see. Or did I actually download, upload the papers? I may have actually uploaded them, okay. Uh, yeah, oh, th these are samples. Yeah, the samples, I did upload them. Yeah, okay, maybe I did upload them. Uh, and that's that's a, a sample sample one pager, sample one pager. But I think, let me check here because I, I was pretty sure that I included the actual, did I, did I not? Sample term paper. I thought for at least for some of them, like for example, reading list, it looks like it's a link, but in reality, it's a drop Dropbox. I mean, it's a, oh, actually I did provide the whole thing. Did I? Because I thought I, I also included, oh, maybe I did take time and actually uploaded the whole thing. Uh, reading list. Uh, oh yeah, all readings in PDF. So what I did instead of uh, giving you the, um, you know, uploading them to, to Canvas and you make, you know, making you download them one by one, I provided you a link to my hard drive. Like literally that's, you know, when you click here, you will see the same things that I just showed you. And when you open them, you can still download them. So it's not a problem. And I think you will not be able to go up the level like you wouldn't see all my files. But here you will see this one and you can download the whole collection. So you just click here, download somewhere, where's download, uh, upload, yeah, I think download. Uh, 
uh, it will be a slightly different interface because you will be using it or seeing it as guests. It wouldn't allow me to download because it's already on my hard drive, but you will be able to download them all at once. And then you will have them as PDFs. And then when you come later, if my, the files on my hard drive have changed, you will see whatever is the latest version at that point. So that's why I was showing you from my hard drive, assuming that you will have access to them through the link that I posted on, uh, on Canvas. And it looks like for some of them, I actually did take the time and uploaded them one by one, like for example, sample assignments, but um, you know, ultimately it's still the same collection. Um, I yeah. have a question. Yes, go Sorry. Ahead, I have a question about like generating ideas. Of course, like we can like read papers and then find ideas by matching like the find the gap or some other things. But I'm wondering, do you have other uh, sources or your uh, you follow some blog or some some news so you can generate ideas based on phenomenon or some uh, even some news articles? That's a very good question. And I, I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer to it. On the one hand, I can promise you this. As you will be reading, so IB is a very new discipline, unlike mathematics or physics, you know, that had been around for centuries. IB is a very, very new discipline. I mean, there has been really nothing done or not much done. Like some of these topics are literally 10, 20 years old. Like for example, we looked at cultural distance. It was introduced in 1988. Uh, we looked at cultural intelligence. That's like 2007. So like literally there was nothing before. And so when you read those papers, I promise you that you will have so many new research ideas. You literally open the paper, you read the first page and like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we can add a twist here. Maybe we can look at men versus women in that same context, or maybe we wanna look at a different cultural context. So the problem will be not coming up with the paper ideas, but you know, selecting the one from the hundreds that you have in mind. But that will be happening mainly as you start reading the papers. And to be honest, I'm not even sure what's the best way to approach it. Uh, you can start looking at some of those papers. You have the full collection and please get some sense of what's done. Another good place, um, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's a good place for everyone, but at least for those who, who wanna study um, people, uh, let me give you the link here. So the X Culture project that I mentioned, uh, so we've had about 85,000 students who've gone through this, but also about 900 professors. And so many of them are very research active. And so we've published dozens and dozens of papers over time, but we have even more in development. And so we have several students in the first cohort who are using X Culture data for their dissertation. We have a, like a gigantic data set. So it's like 2,000 and half, uh, 2.5 thousand uh, variables, multi-level, multi-source, uh, multi-method, longitudinal, and we share them with the students for, you know, freely. And so we have several, like Karen Linden is using our data. Uh, here we have Leah, for example, who already did some research using that, those same data. And so one thing you can do is you can look at the papers that we are currently working on. So there are like 40, 50 papers in development. Likewise, if you go to, for researchers, you can also look at what, what has been published. And that will, again, I bet give you a lot of ideas. Like you will see, okay, they're trying to study uh, virtual team, uh, or that this one's kind of complicated, but like the size matter. So does the size of the team affect team dynamics and performance? And so you will think, okay, well, size is an interesting topic. How about gender composition? Does it affect uh, the dynamics and performance of global virtual teams? Or maybe how about diversity of those teams? Or how about age of those teams? And so here you have one idea, but you know you substitute one key variable and you got like five other papers and each of them can become potentially a separate dissertation. Uh, here is one, by the way, on the fault lines. And so here we're looking at how social networks form. But again, I'm sure you will think of at least a couple of other ideas of similar kind, like, you know, for example, fault lines and conflicts. So do they really lead to conflicts? Or maybe our fault lines, uh, you know, along age are, are weaker or not as, as problematic as, a lot, you know, fault lines along, I don't know, maybe gender or maybe culture. So maybe, you know, this would be, if you go simply look for xculture.org, and once you're on the website, if you go for researchers, you'll see what we have published or working on. And so here you will hopefully have some ideas. You can also look at the data. And again, as you're going through the list of the variables, some of them may give you some ideas like, oh, so they measure, for example, the communication tools that the students use in those teams. Oh, how about maybe, you know, if they use only email versus when they use Zoom with video, does that affect how they think about one another or how they perform? Or, you know, uh, they measure where the students are located so they know the time zones. Hey, let's do a study on, for example, the time zone separation. Is it really a problem? Does it lead to more conflicts through meetings or maybe not? And so, as I said, the challenge likely will be not coming up with 
ideas, but selecting a few good ones from hundreds that you have. So, but in any Thank case, you. you know, initially just think about what you think is important. Like imagine that you have to manage an international company, multinational com company. What kind of challenges do you think you will have as a manager? And then once you have that, you just build a study around each of those with the goal of answering those questions. All right, any other questions administratively? Yeah. And for the final paper that we're submitting, um, is it actually a paper format or a full outline? Um, ideally, it looks like a paper, but you have only the front end. So you have uh, introduction, literature, review, theory, and maybe a little bit on, on, on methods uh, in a sense that maybe what kind of data you will use and what kind of analysis you will like literally a couple of lines. You will likely take my next course, um, Management 703, uh, Business 703, which is um, survey of the methods field. And so in that one, we will talk about every plausible and possible method. And so there you will, in the ideal world, you will take the paper that you write for this, uh, 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 for this project and you will add the full method section to it. And so that way you don't, in fact, most students, that's exactly what they did. So they literally just kept working on the same paper. And my hope is that as you take other courses, you kept work, like for example, if for this course, you wanna use, reuse some of the papers from your previous work, no problem. For my methods course, not only it's no problem, but I strongly encourage you that you take a paper that you write either for this course or for Aisha's IB or B course, sorry, or for Moses' strategy course, and then write a proper method section for it. So I kind of hope that you will use the same idea and build on it, build on it, so kind of expand it. So by the time you're ready to start your dissertation, you already have like half of it done. So I don't see that as cheating. I see that as, uh, you know, um, efficiency, I guess, or, 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 you know, going deeper and deeper in the same topic. So, so therefore, yeah, you probably will change your interests and maybe whatever you write for this course by the time you take my methods course or write the dissertation, maybe it will be a little outdated and you will wanna work on something else. But in the ideal world, it will be the same paper, but instead of you know, two lines on methods, you will actually have a proper multi-page section on methods. All right, so a couple more things and I guess I will not really lecture you, but I will do a quick review of the literature on today's topic. And I even have the slides, so I guess I'll just go through the slides, but um, um, you, will, you will do the readings to understand it better. So one, what is IB? So since the course is about IB theory, uh, so um, as I said, it's a multidisciplinary you know, area of research. And so it can be just about anything and not only business related, sociology can fall into it, anthropology can fall into it. But there are a few topics that are sort of uh, inherently international business. So you can take a look at, uh, for example, you know, uh, mergers and acquisitions in international context, marketing in international context, communication in international context. So those become a little, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of general area made international. But some things are inherently international. Like for example, distance, uh, you know, when we talk about cultural distance, uh, geographic distance, it kind of makes it international by definition. When we talk about culture, again, it, it makes, you know, it's, it's inherently international business. Time zones are sort of relevant here. When we talk about some legal differences, political differences, institutional differences, again, so it kind of becomes, because we're talking about differences among countries, it becomes international. My apology, someone, can you take that squeaking toy from the dog? My apology about that. Can I, can I ask a question so, about that last slide? Yes. Um, so when you're searching, are there best practices? Like if I, I'm in HR, so if I were to look at HR um, studies, how would you best search so it has that IB lens? Well, HR is easy. You take any topic in HR, from recruitment to selection, to performance appraisal, to labor relations, to uh, whatever else falls into this category. And you just add the word international, like for That's example, it. international recruitment, you know, how is it different? What can go wrong? Compensation, compensation in the international context, you know, how can things go wrong? And so I, I, I don't think you need to look for anything because any single issue, I used to teach HR a long time ago, and I know that you can take any topic in HR and then just ask, so how is it different when you have people from different countries? And all of a sudden you have, you know, a whole field of research to yourself. So, so all you have to do is add the word international. Yeah, like essentially, in your... you know, put yourself in international context. So in the classic context, you have people from the same country, from the same territory, so to speak. 
but how would it be different when you had people from different countries? And that's it. So, you know, compensation. So, you know, like for example, piece rate versus uh, uh, hourly wage versus team-based versus individual based. Well, so we know that some of them work better, others work works, worse, but what if you have people from different countries? Well, it turns out that maybe collectivists want to be based, compensation based on, on groups and individualist individually and stuff like that. Someone please, can you help me here? I apologize, my apology about the dog, so yes. Uh, so, but yeah, same thing with strategy, same thing. So as I said, you talk about mergers and acquisitions or entry modes, you know, it's easy to make them international. But again, some of the things are sort of inherently international business and that makes it a little bit easier. Like if you talk about currency differences, it's, it's you know, international. If you talk maybe about online communication, it kind of becomes international. So, so pure idea here are some of the topics that are, you know, as ideas it gets. International trade at the company, I mean, the country level, regional integration like NAFTA, European Union, I mean, obviously it's IB, multinational corporations, uh, international market entry modes, uh, global virtual teams. So, and there are some things. So we'll primarily focus on these topics uh, because, you know, that's IB, but again, we could take just about any topic and make it IB. Um, so this is the list of topics. And again, maybe going back to Michael's question. So this is the list of topics in the standard IB textbook. So uh, I, I have a collection of at least a dozen of them and pretty much all of them cover the same topics. So they all start with globalization, then they talk about culture and then they go all the way you can look through these topics. So um, any of these are good. And as I said, you can even take whatever topic you wanna work on, just add, you know, if the people came from different countries, how would it be different? And so that would be perfectly fine as well. Now, a little bit about theory. And so here it's not so much to school you on theory, but because you have to write a theoretical paper proposal, I want to make sure that you know what theory is. And so you have a bunch of readings that I highly, highly recommend. Like this first lecture, believe me, whatever you read for this first lecture from that list, it will serve you very, very well. The subsequent topics, yeah, you may never do research in that area, so it may not be necessarily something that you really need but you need to know what theory is and theory is not. And some of these papers, as I said, you know, you will struggle with publishing work if you don't know these things. And so uh, there is this very interesting uh, topic on, you know, what is theory literally called? I think it's what, what theory is not, I think what it's called. And so um, uh, it talks a little bit about what is theory, what theory is and what it's not. And so theory is not citing stuff. Theory is not providing lists of variables. Theory is not even, you know, providing a bunch of hypotheses, diagrams, or data. So theory is something different. So theory, that's when you come up with a good explanation of how things, or what, of why things happen, or how they work. And so for your proposal, when it comes to, to, to the hypothesis and research questions, you need to choose one of these five or six, six here. So you can either hypothesize a relationship, so you will say uh, A affects B, or A relates with B. Or you would need to hypothesize the difference. So your question will be, does A, uh, you know, research question, does A affect B, or what affects B? And then your, your hypothesis or theory is A affects B, and then you explain why or how. Differences, so A is different from B. And again, your theory is, why is it different? In which way is it different? Lesser known type, but it still would be theory development when you come up with the typology. So you would say, for example, cultural intelligence consists, uh, intelligence consists of three components, X, Y, Z, whatever they are. There are actually four in the most popular model. So you can come up with some sort of a typology or, or, or you know, a classification. It can be some sort of a mapping. So you have some, some, you know, some constructs or some, some phenomena and you can map them on some sort of a two by two matrix and you will show how they relate to one another. So that would be also a theory that explains how these things sort of work together. Or maybe you describe a process, like, you know, like how A progresses over time, you know, like when teams are formed, they go from so-called forming to storming to norming to performing to adjourning. So it's a theory of team development or team life stages. So uh, it's by um, um, 1965, I forgot the name. So anyway, or maybe you want to describe some conditions. So like experimental studies. So if you do A, then B happens. It's kind of like the first one. So A relates to B. But it could be, you know, if A, then B happens. But if you do C, then D happens. So it is kind of an expanded version of that very first one. So when you explain why and how things work, that's your theory. And importantly, it generalizes to different contexts. So you tested it with one sample, but you know why it happens and how it happens. So you can say 
Well, if they have a similar sample, you will expect the same results. Uh, so theory versus research question versus hypothesis versus test. Again, going back to what Michael asked. So for example, maybe your general question will be, so why some people do better than others in global virtual teams? So that's your big question. So yes, yeah, some people are very effective, others are not. Why is that the case? And maybe your theory is that, well, cultural intelligence. Some people are culturally intelligent, others are not. And cultural intelligence aids performance. So uh, the more cultural intelligence, the better performance. Well, how would I test this theory? Well, I'll measure cultural intelligence in the sample and I'll measure their performance and then I'll see if there is a correlation. Or maybe you'll have a more sophisticated theory, maybe it's with a moderation, maybe it matters more in big teams but less in small teams, or maybe it matters more for young people but less for old people, whatever you know, those uh, refinements will be. And then your test will be literally some sort of a test of correlation or regression. So these are the things sort of, you know, some, sometimes, the, the frequent problem I see is that people would state research question and present it as a hypothesis. So it's the most common. So the, the question asks why or how. The hypothesis says A affects B or uh, A leads to B or A is different from B or, you know, so it's a testable, you know, sort of relationship or, or difference or, or statement. Um, and then you have a little bit of readings that I recommend that you read about this whole almost obsession with theory in our uh, field. And so instead of, you know, going through the many word slides, I'll kind of summarize the issue. Um, if you want to publish a paper in management, uh, management strategy, marketing, just about anything related to business, most likely and almost always you will run into the problem where the reviewers and the editor will say, editor will say that you don't have enough theory. It drives me crazy and it drives some people crazy. So it's, it's many people believe that it's bad. The explanation for this obsession with theory is that uh, at the beginning of the century when the field of management was kind of emerging as a, as a research, as a you know, field of science, the management scientists at that time felt inferior to the real scientists in the white lab coats, you know, physicists, uh, biologists, you know, whoever else. And so to prove that they are real scientists and not just talkers, they wanted to sort of, you know, present their field as a real field of research. And so the way they did it, they said, well, we're gonna be theory, you know, like we all wanna rely on theory. So we're not just going to describe what people do, but we wanna theorize. And that's a good intention. The problem is that it came to the obsession where you cannot publish anything unless it has good theory, whatever that is. And so what happens in our field is that, my apology, we are babysitting a dog for neighbors and uh, just one second. And unlike my dog, she's a little less controlled, so I expropriated them. So uh, what happens almost always is uh, the situation described in one of, of your papers. The situation goes like this. Uh, it's um, 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 Carnegie Mellon, if I remember correctly, and uh, an invited speaker talks about a project that he uh, is working on. The audience is full of not only PhD students, but esteemed scholars, including a couple of them are Nobel laureates and everybody loves the idea. But then the author, the presenter says, so I have this idea, I have the test, I have the data, the results are interesting and intriguing, but I'm afraid I don't have a good theory or enough theory to publish it in the top journal. And so for the next 20 minutes, all of the people in the audience go through their kind of mental catalog of theories and they say, how about Mendenhall's 1965? Maybe that's a good theory. Oh, how about, for example, Kimbrick's 1948? So that seems like a good theory. How about signaling theory? That seems to be applicable here. Oh, how about fault lines? That's actually a good theory. And then one of them says, this is crazy. You have a good, important question. You have the answer. Who cares about the theory? Why do we need to artificially, you know, wrap it in a theory to publish it? I mean, and then worst of, worst of all, we sort of pretend that we had theory first because you know, good science goes theory, hypothesis, test. But in reality, we do the opposite. We have the question, we have the data, we have the results, and then we try to wrap it up in theory. But the problem is that that's how the game works. You cannot publish anything in top journal unless you have theory. And so to a large extent, that's why we have this course. And uh, yeah, so you have several papers that kind of talk about this game. And so they talk a little bit about how uh, you know, the problem, they talk about so-called harking, so hypothesizing after results are known. Uh, they talk about how that leads to uh, sometimes results being published that are not really representing the truth. 
And so all kinds of interesting related issues that you will be faced with so many times. Uh, so I actually wanna conclude with a paper that I'm so envious of published two years ago in the American, American some organic chemistry something journal, like a top journal in chemistry. The paper is literally, I'm not kidding you. I think I even included the copy of the paper. The paper is called the effect of crap on, uh, on, on, uh, on electrical conductivity of, 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 of graphene, I believe. And so they said, we literally took chick chicken poop. And so we had like five different chicken poops. Like, you know, we had broiler, we had some other chicken, some other chicken. We mixed that crap with graphene and we tested if it changed the, the conductivity of graphene. And sure enough, some chicken poop type one increased it by 12%. And that's the study. And it was published in the top journal. It was done kind of sarcastically. But I mean, they found a way to improve electrical conductivity by 12%. Nobody asked about theory. Nobody cared that they literally used crap. And so it's an important discovery and they published it. In management, I mean, like for example, we had a big, big problem published in a paper not so long ago where we wanted to know if students from better universities perform better. So you are a manager, you wanna hire people. Do you need to hire people from Ivy League or can you hire someone from the middle of the range or from the bottom of the range? And if, there, if you hire all of them, what will be the performance difference? Well, in Exculture, we've had a total of about 900 universities that participated over the years from top Ivy League to like literally you've never heard about somewhere in Slovenia. And so because all of them completed the same business consulting project and we had 117, I believe, data perf performance indicators from peer evaluations to quality of work to timeliness to diligence, we had a perfect test to test if it matters. And so we had the important question, we had perfect data, we had the results, you know, we, we did find that, that people from, by the way, do you think there is a difference or not? I'm just curious. So do people from top schools perform better than people from average schools? There are a total of about 20,000 ranked and accredited universities in the world. So if you hired someone from top 10 versus someone from the very middle, what would be the average performance difference? If any. So how did you measure performance? We had a multi-indicator uh, sort of co composite measure, but it was primarily um, um, peer evaluations, quality of work, and uh, peer evaluations were like intellectual contribution, uh, friendliness, uh, effort, uh, leadership, and then the quality of work, it was basically a quality of the work that they produced, but also measured as uh, economic viability, strength of arguments, uh, use of research, uh, uh, formatting quality, uh, and plagiarism, I believe. And then we basically put it all together, although the results were you know, looking at each one separately as well. So overall, it was uh, about 1.7% improvement for every thousand positions university rankings. So it would be about 17.5% difference from top school versus very average school. Is it enough? I mean, yes, there is a difference. And I guess if you have a thousand people and each of them performs 17% more, yeah, it seems like it makes sense. But what we also found was that people from top schools were much more likely to have conflicts, to be not loved by their team members, uh, so they basically are not so good at, they seem to focus too much on the task and sometimes sacrifice their personal relationships. But when it comes to the actual quality of work, they do a better job, but only by this much. It seems like it's an important thing. Managers want to know it, students want to know it, I want to know it as an academic. And we had six rejections before we published it. And then eventually we published a follow-up study in Harvard Business Review, so after the first one. But every time it was not enough theory, what's your theory? Who cares what the theory is? I mean, we came up with a theory eventually. So we had like uh, a theory of why they would be better, why they would be worse, like better training or maybe better inspiring environment or maybe they're arrogant, but it almost seemed like it was unjustifiable in my opinion. So I don't know. Anyway, be prepared for even good important studies that have practical implications not to be published because you don't have enough theory. And the readings for this week will help you sort of better understand what a good theoretical paper is, what theory looks like, because it is a game to some extent and you sort of need to learn templates and then it will be easy for you. And if you don't, uh, then it will be very hard for you. But yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here. So let me see if I missed anything, but uh, yeah. So uh, I'm not gonna go through each of the papers to read them. Uh, any final questions? I have a quick question. Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, you changed the dates in the syllabus, but I was just wondering, um, do we still have something due this next week or did you shift the dates of the Let's assignments so, as well yeah, that's as a good the question. class? And, and indeed the dates have been changed a few times. So it's very possible 
as you will notice, I'm not very good in terms of attention to details. So uh, I kind of warn, warn you in advance and apologize in advance. Uh, but yeah so, yeah, so we start today, right? Then 29 seems like it's correct. Uh, six seems, seems correct. 13, 20, 27. So yeah, it seems like it's correct now. And so uh, th this syllabus is on, this, uh, on, the, on, on Canvas. Uh, I think I may have uploaded an earlier version some time ago, but now it's definitely this version. And yeah, so this week there are no assignments, right? And so live session is but today. You still show the paper ideas due, and you mentioned earlier that you didn't care about dates and assignments and all, so these may not be relevant based off of what you're saying, but if you look at the in Canvas, let me just check the assignment oh, real quickly. In the, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, my apology. Yeah, that I, oh, very good. Yeah, I forgot about that. So yes, the, the due date, it's always Sunday midnight of the week, you know, so so assignment two will be due at the end okay. of week two and so on. But yes, you're absolutely right. I okay. probably forgot to update. Yeah, you're talking about the assignments here, right? Yeah. And Right. Uh, I just apology. didn't know whether to yeah, follow those dates or not. That. Uh, yeah, no yeah. Problem. So I completely forgot about that and didn't update them. So I'll do it right away. So, yeah, my my, my mistake. So I, I think I did put the initial dates, assuming that we start last week. But now I need to add seven days to each deadline. So yeah, yeah. My apology about that. So it should be. So easy. it's due the Sunday after the session. Yeah. So your first assignment is due. The three ideas I do on Sunday of the next week. So about 10, what is it, 30, uh, 12 days from now or something like that. Okay. And so each so time it's the same time. deadline. So midnight of Sunday, and then yeah, try to be not late. But as I said, if you need an extension, let me know. Uh, I don't think anybody asked for an extension last semester. There was one or two times when students just didn't submit anything period. But uh, so again, my job is not to teach you to stick with the deadlines. Um, so it's, it's more, you know, if you do it, I'm happy, even if it's a little late. Uh, the only thing is, if you can, please try to do it on time. So this way I will review them on Monday and send you feedback end of the day, Monday or Tuesday. And if you're not done, you may not be in that cohort. And so it kind of breaks my workflow, but not a huge deal overall. Yes, and my apology for not updating the, the due dates in, in Canvas. So, um, so that's something I completely forgot about. All right, anything else? I did, ad I, I was just gonna joke and say, I did admit at the beginning of the class I was a project manager. So I was very attentive to the dates. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, ideally we're all gonna stay on time, but again, you know, you probably have, uh, you know, your jobs and your family obligations and whatever else, plus it's summer. And then it is a very intensive course. I kind of wish it was taught during the regular semester so that we can, could go a little deeper in some of these things. But with what it is, it would be very hard to, you know, like the whole six weeks to always be on time and do nothing else. So we'll see how things go. But yeah, a little deviation from schedule is not a problem. All right. Okay. Well, Boz, the I, only thing I would yeah. say anytime that you want to point us to videos is great. I, I know in your syllabus, you had some videos and I went out and clicked through some of them that recordings that you had, culture and some of your stuff in your other class. And any time that you know that there's some videos you think would be good supplemental for the upcoming lectures, that's great because then we can all work that in in our time coming up to it. So that kind of suggestion is highly appreciated. Sure, yeah. yeah, and I already have, as I said, the link for Management 301 class. So if you want to take a look at it, let me actually take a quick, very quick look here if I didn't miss anything else in the course. Because uh, I have a feeling that there was something else in the slides that I didn't comment. So you have the readings, you have sample assignments. One thing that I also included, I, I downloaded the best dissertations um, as judged by the Academy of International Business for the last five years or something like that more. So uh, again, just in case you, you would like to uh, take a look at you know, what those dissertations look like. And so you even have the recording with the author of this dissertation. And then uh, we also had uh, a guest speaker, um, my, my co-editor on several journals. And so he was talking a little bit about the publishing game. Again, we have the recording in his slides here as well. And I think I included my dissertation. It didn't win any awards, but since I will be referring to it, you might want to take a look just, uh, you know, if you wanted to look at the data. So, uh, and other than that, I think it's pretty much it. So, and then syllabus, yeah, so everything seems to be fine. So, and then yes, you have all of the files available in files, but if you go in modules, you will have like for each week, you will have everything here. 
So you'll have the assignment, you have the readings, you have the uh, live session from the last semester and we'll uh, add the recording of the current session once we're done. So this way you don't even have to sort of wonder what to do this week, you just open this week's module and go point by point. All right. Okay, well then good night and um, I'll see you in a week. And uh, so there is really no homework assignment other than just look at those papers. You will not regret the first week readings. You will not regret that you read them now because it will determine what you can publish and how, how, how productive you are as, as a researcher. So definitely worthwhile. So some of them, I wish I had them as a student because I, I learned about them much later and uh, so many mistakes I had done before I sort of better understood the game. All right, well, thank you so much and uh, see you in a week. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm.